everyone. <laughs> this morning we've got um, Maxim Lin. Maxim is a freelance developer who's cur who currently specialises in Flutter development in his work as a developer relations engineer at Code Magic. In today's talk, Maxim will take us on a journey into the fascinating niche world of electronic music making using hardware synthesizers, samplers, and, a tr and drum machines. Please welcome Maxim. Oh, thanks very much, everyone. And thank you very much for coming to my talk this morning. Um, yeah, so just a quick bit more about me. I've, a uh, long-time Android uh, developer who now does uh, Flutter for his sins. And more recently, I've become a developer relations engineer at CodeMagic, which is a mobile and Flutter-focused uh, CI, CD service. And also, in terms of community, like I've been involved with our local uh, Google developer group here in Melbourne for quite a while, and we also, a few years ago, spun off uh, Flutter Melbourne from that for people interested in uh, Flutter development here in Melbourne. Now, all of these things, uh, as you may have noticed, have absolutely zero to do with uh, music and music production. And to be honest, like until about a couple of years ago, I had absolutely no idea about anything at all involved with music apart from listening to it. So I have the distinct honor, according to my year nine uh, music teacher, of having the lowest ever score on uh, note and rhythm recognition tests. So I'm not only tone deaf, but rhythm deaf. However, this did not stop me um, during COVID from having an exchange with um, a person called Bob Nystrom. Um, Bob is in his day job uh, on, the Dart of, uh, on the Dart language team, writing the Dart compiler. But in one of his hobbies, he actually makes electronic music. And I happened to watch one of his uh, videos and afterwards um, just sent him a message on, uh, tagged him on uh, Twitter saying, this was amazing. I was so impressed how he and other pe colleagues who I work with are so uh, into music and are very often quite talented musicians. And I just wished I had like a modicum of that. And Bob's um, rather fateful words were, well, it's never too late. So I went, well, I think this was just before the next uh, lockdown that we had here in Melbourne. So uh, it's not that I had a lot of time on my hands with kids at home, but like, I thought, well, this might be a good chance to learn a bit more about it. And down the rabbit hole I went. So uh, in terms of what I'm going to be talking about, there's a huge, huge area uh, when it comes to um, electronic music, not just music in general. And so there are niches within sub-niches within sub-niches. And the one I want to talk about today is um, using electronic devices to make uh, electronic music. And so here's, to give you a flavor of it, this is the video from my memory, the first one that I watched of Bob's. He's made quite a few. Um, oh, hang on, I better unmute that. Hopefully that comes up on. Yeah, it, it starts quiet. So this is, the, I think, the first performance that I saw um, of Bob using uh, this device, which is uh, an, an Electribe 2 made by a company called Korg, which is fairly big in the music scene. While we're watching this, sorry, I wonder, just show of hands, who knows uh, or has dabbled in electronic music production? So someone who might know what a synthesizer is versus a sampler. Oh, awesome. So there's a few people. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and keep um, my explanation short, but um, enough to cover people who have, aren't across it. So why I said performance is that in this case, it's a standalone musical instrument, or some people might say it's just a device, but I think it's an instrument because it involves the person, in this case, Bob, actually performing, like making ch like changes to the music on the fly as you would with maybe a more traditional instrument like a piano or guitar or electronic synthesizer, where he's like manipulating um, which uh, parts or tracks are playing. He's uh, applying filters or removing filters to different parts that are playing. So it really is a performance. Um, this in this one, I think this is one of his first ones. So he probably admit this is probably the lowest key one. But there are others which are much more involved. And like there are some 
um, professional musicians who do these performances and it involves a large amount of manual dexterity and coordination to control the gear that they're using to perform with. So I'll just stop that there. And, oops, move on. So what Bob was using there was a groove box. And the reason I asked for a show of hands was I thought I better know if everyone knows what one is, I don't need to explain it. But in this case, I'll give you a quick rundown. So groove boxes are these standalone pieces of hard, musical hardware like Bob was using that contains, a, normally, they're not um, always, but they'll normally contain a synthesizer or a sampler. A synthesizer synthesizes music from just raw waveforms. Samplers will play back samples, like little rec tiny recordings of um, music or some other sound. They'll often have a built-in drum machine, so the thing that, like in the 80s, people thought might replace drummers, but didn't really, but are used a lot throughout um, music production, especially in pop music. And sequences, because it's, enough to, it's not enough to just have a, sequence, a synthesizer or a sampler that produces notes or sounds, you want something that sequences it into a track, into a score of music. So all these things basically make up a uh, groove, what's called a groove box, because you can often get standalone pieces of hardware that do just one of these functions, but groove boxes are kind of uh, a genre or like a set of instruments that cover like all, most or all of those functions. And this is just a, for something that's really a niche of electronic music production, because I should say that recently most electronic music producers use uh, software called DAWs, or DAWs, Digital Audio Workstations, basically the audio equivalent of a video editor to produce their music. But there is like this niche, like I said, or um, a sub-niche where people do doorless, what they call doorless music, which is producing electronic music just with these standalone devices. And for something that is a niche, it's amazing just the amount of variety of devices from a number of, quite a large number of manufacturers, some well-known ones like Yamaha or Roland that people who might say use electro electronic uh, synthesizers or pianos would recognize those names. Whereas others like Electron uh, are much more niche. They focus just on these devices and are much smaller companies. But it's amazing, like, just the variety. So the one in the middle here, there, I've got uh, here with me today. This is the circuit tracks by a company called Novation in the UK. Now, the interesting thing you might notice with that is the complete absence of any screen. There is The UI consists of buttons, which light up, dials and um, in rotary encoders, there, but there's no screen. So the whole, con it's a fairly complex piece of equipment, but there is no screen, which in today's um, day and age, if you like, is quite unusual. Like we're so used to having basically a large high definition screen in our pockets that having an electronic device and controlling it with no screen at all probably seems a bit unusual to people these days. Now. The other thing that all these devices had in common was that they are proprietary, not even open source, let alone open hardware. These are completely closed. I briefly owned the blue one there, the uh, Electribe that Bob was playing just in a um, different colored version. And there was a chap online, I think he's based in England, who was reverse engineering the firmware and binary patching bits of it to change or modify or add functionality but that was just like, I, I got into that for a little bit, but that was just crazy stuff. Like, I have better things to do in my life than binary patch, a proprietary firmware from a manufacturer who cares nothing about updating or supporting the device. That they're still, like, not that they've abandoned, that they're still selling in the shops, but they have not sent out an update, a, a firmware update for like about four years. So instead, I kind of got inspired to think about, well, what about a DIY groove box? Like, being a software developer and engineer is both a blessing and a curse because you always see someone else's efforts and go, I could do that. No, I can do better than that. Um, but what happens is that when you start doing it, you realize there's a reason that there are companies doing this rather than individuals because it tends to be a lot of work to produce a professional uh, device. But anyway, I didn't let that stop me. So this is the project I came to talk to you about that I've been working on and off on for about a year or so now.
um, in various incarnations. So my DIY groove box uh, might look a bit like um, yeah, a DIY version of those ones, but the main difference is that it's, this thing that you're seeing is not a groove box. It's what's called a MIDI controller. It's essentially the equivalent of a keyboard or a mouse or a touchpad. It's just an input device. It does not make any sound. There is no hardware in there to make sounds of any sort. So hence the other bit that's in the picture, which is in this case a Raspberry Pi 4, whose job it is to make the sounds based on the inputs coming from this controller. So that was my starting point, is I thought, well, this is pretty much what I want in terms of the hardware. I do not want to make something and like solder up a bunch of buttons and encoders and potentially even a small uh, screen. So instead, this, I chose this as my starting point, which admittedly is a proprietary like hardware product, but luckily, it uses MIDI. Now, I've mentioned MIDI a couple of times. There's probably people here who don't know, hands up who doesn't know what MIDI is or hasn't heard of it. Oh, actually, okay, there's not too many, cool. So I'll be really quick about this because I thought I'd have to explain this. I've done this talk, similar talk to other audiences where MIDI wasn't a well-known thing. So it's basically a, both a protocol and like a hardware specification, but the thing I'm most involved, uh, interested in is it's like a protocol that these days mostly runs over USB. Originally, it was over a serial uh, connection. And yes, 31 kilobits was the original speed because it was a nice, mul oh, sorry, 31.25 because that was a nice multiple of one megahertz, which is what most of the equipment was in the early 80s when MIDI got started as like um, a populous, um, and I think it's become an industry standard even though it wasn't quite um, like picked up by any standards body. So luckily for me, even though this was a proprietary device, a really nice person called Paul Curtis had published a set of articles um, a couple of years before me, or a year and a half before me, where titled Decoding the Akai MIDI Fire uh, Implementation, where he figured out all the non-standard MIDI bits because MIDI is made up of both a standard set of specifications, and then there's this kind of like vendor-specific uh, bit where vendors can just do whatever the hell they like. Sorry for my language. So, like, unfortunately, the Akai controller had some standard bits, like, say, the button LEDs, very simple to figure out. Like, you could just basically do it with almost no reference to any documentation. And illuminating the LEDs was uh, like a little bit more work to figure out, but he did that really quickly, according to his write-up. But then there were things like figuring out how those colored pads work and how the computer can tell the controller to light up those pads, which was very proprietary, very specific to this controller. And note the bit about that even when he tried to use Wireshark, it couldn't handle like the crazy non-standard stuff that they did. Luckily, he did all that work um, to figure that out, and so I got to benefit from it. The other thing you may have noticed with the controller was that it has an OLED screen, a really tiny, like less than one inch OLED screen, but actually up close, or like at the normal operating distance, it's actually very clear, like even though it's tiny, but it has a yet even crazier over MIDI implementation. Like, for those of you who've done electronics, you might have thought oh, it's I2C or it's SPI controlled. That's how these devices normally are controlled. And internally, it probably is like an I2C device in, with the, whatever microcontroller controls this contraption. But externally, you talk to it over MIDI with this absolutely crazy mapping that, thank God, I did not have to figure out. Paul did that for me and had like published that. Um, mapping. So f all that was left for me was to look at his C code uh, and basically translate that matrix into dark code. Now, use it, even though I'd done this and I got it working, it wasn't super fun to do all this low-level um, stuff. I I'm these days, I have done embedded C a long time ago. These days, I do like Dart and Flutter, much more high-level stuff. So I quickly packaged all this up into um, some Dart packages, like NPM modules, for those of you who use NPM, that sort of thing, uh, just into a library that hid the, all this away from me. So I, once I'd done it, I never had to think about it again. And those packages basically presented me with a much nicer interface, or presented me and whoever else uses it with a much nicer interface. So for instance, you just get a list, sorry for those who don't know Dart, but hopefully this is very C-like, you can understand what's happening here. It's just an array of Booleans, because that OLED is just monochrome, it's just 
each pixel is on or off. And as you can see by the sizing, it's actually 128 by 64 pixels, so not exactly high res. So basically, it's just an array of Booleans, and whichever one's on and off, that's how the screen gets lit up. So these are the packages I made that wrap up on a next level, kind of like the more um, everyday bits of uh, code that I needed to draw onto this. So doing a font, luckily another um, old, co just by sheer coincidence, a really old colleague of mine, uh, Susan Hinton, had created a bitmap font for these devices because she was mucking around with them using Node.js. And I, she also had some drawing routines that I shamelessly pinched and converted from TypeScript to Dart. And so I had this more, still low level, but slightly higher level API so I could just have basically something that uh, is a canvas and you can just do drawing operate, you know, the standard draw line, draw square, fill, those sort of really basic canvassy things that people are probably familiar with. Um, lots of different APIs like the web canvas and so forth. Okay, I've talked about the input and a little bit of the output, but the main output is sound. We want music. We, well, hopefully, in my case, at least sounds, if not really <laughs> listenable music. Now, what people who may have done any kind of um, sound programming that required low latency would realize is it is absolutely insane to try and do that with a garbage collected language like Dart because there's whole papers that have been written about how crazy it is to even use malloc, for those of you who are C literate, to um, allocate memory while you're in the time sensitive bit of the code that actually is pushing audio data out to the sound card when you're doing low latency. Like, it doesn't matter if you're playing back an MP4 or something like, that's not low latency. Low latency is when you're pressing a key and you want the sound to come out as fast as possible out of the speaker, not when you're like listening to a, like a music track or watching a video. So for that sort of thing, a garbage collected language is no good. Like even, like I said, they, they, people tell you not to do memory allocations on the thread that's doing that because the malloc might potentially take too long. So this was, yeah, using Dart was no go. So what could I do? Well, I shopped around for different ways of getting sound out and I settled on this, which was uh, a thing called Sunvox. Sunvox um, is, again, like a niche within a niche. It's a small, fast and powerful modular synthesizer with a pattern-based sequencer, brackets tracker. So it also comes, luckily for me, in a library version because Sunvox itself is not um, open source. It's like a free or slightly paid for um, product. But it ha its core audio library is an MIT licensed open source library. Perfect for what I needed. I just wanted the sound bit. I did not want um, a full, basically, audio package. Now, a little tangent because of those brackets tracker. Um, what is a tracker? For those of you who had a misspent youth like me in the 80s, might have heard of trackers because it, they were often used to, it was the software that was used to produce the audio tracks that played when you applied the crack on your favorite game that you <laughs> did not legally purchase and hence did not have the whatever DRM was trying to protect. And so this was the days, like we're talking the 80s, like days of the 16-bit computers like the Amiga 500s, trackers became very popular. They basically preceded these digital audio workstations that are now the mainstream way of making electronic music. So the trackers like gradually died away on computers, like they're still used like in um, some places like the demo scene. But what's happened strangely to me recently that I've discovered it is that there's been a resurgence in interest based on hardware trackers. So these are coming back again to my original kind of topic. These are like stand these standalone Groovebox devices, but now done in the format of trackers. Now, what the, I guess the key thing about trackers is that they have this grid-like, people call it spreadsheet, Excel-like way of laying out the tracks, unlike digital audio stations, which usually look like a more a piano roll, for those of you who are musically inclined, uh, UI. So for me, Sunbox like, was perfect because it was a really, as you can see, mature, long-term project that's been around so long that it had a Palm OS version. <laughs> But also meant that it was super. That meant it was super lightweight. If it ran on Palm OS, even like back in the day, that meant if I wanted something that was going to run a low-powered single-board computer like a Raspberry Pi, and my intention isn't to use a Raspberry Pi 4 in the end, but something much more low-powered. This is just a convenient um, prototyping device. 
this looked like a gold mine. This looked like the thing I wanted. Uh, thankfully, it's maintained an author so has still been going at it for like over 10 years, or maybe closer to 15 years now. So it looks like it's not going away anytime soon. So like I said, the Sunvox app itself has a UI like this. I don't want any of that UI. That is the thing that I'm not trying to do. I am trying to build a hardware device. So instead, I've got a lightweight library that lets me put out the sound. Its source is available. There's, if I have time, there's a little bit of a complicated story about how open source, open source, um, LibSunvox is. But anyway, it's open source enough. Um, and so basically, all I need to do is a way to call it from Dart. Nice thing is Dart has, and I'm going to like put on my Dart advocate hat here. Dart, to, m to me, has a beautiful FFI. Uh, that's a foreign function interface for those of you who uh, haven't uh, needed to call basically um, one language from another language. So in this case, it's a way of calling any, basically any C code, any C library from Dart. And what it means is that I have basically in fairly non-technical terms, it, has, it gives me a really easy and clean way of making use of a C library, which is what libsunvox is, from my Dart code, which is no good for generating the audio itself. So libsunvox does all the audio playback and generation for me. Dart is kind of like the puppet master. It just sends things like play or go to this point in time or stop or pause, that sort of thing, or switch tracks or mute tracks. So it's just like the control system, as you like. So it gives me a nice high-level language to do all my control stuff in. LibSunvox does all the low-level, nitty-gritty audio uh, playback and synthesis for me. And sorry, that's one thing I probably should say when I say the word synthesis. I said, mentioned synthesizers and samplers a little while ago. So basically, synthesizers use raw, sine, square, triangle waves to create audio, or another technique called frequency modulation. Samplers play back little bits. So you might have a recording of a piano, a recording of a snare drum, kick drum, some um, guitar, and just use those little um, snippets of audio and tu sometimes tunes them up and down to get the notes. And so those are kind of like the two main ways these instruments generate musical sounding sounds. So the trackers in bygone days were all samplers because all those computers had really minimal CPU power. These days, we've got huge amounts of CPU power in our phones, let alone on our laptops and desktops. So synthesis um, is quite feasible in terms of a modern tracker. And so Sunvox does both. It lets you play back samples, but it also that's the, where the modular bit comes in this description. It kind of gives you all these little modules that generate different types of sounds, different types of waves that you can stick together, apply effects to, and get all these different kinds of um, musical outputs. So having that, basically, I need to get back to my core um, goal, which is getting something running on a device. So the, the idea is it has to run on the, something like a Pi, because I want to put a single board computer plus battery into that um, Akai controller's case and have something that's reasonably standalone, like those group standalone groove boxes. They're like usually battery powered standalone devices, like the like this one that I showed. You see no cables; it's just running off an internal battery, and it's fairly lightweight, not too thick. That's kind of like the end goal. So I need something that uh, is low powered enough, probably lower powered than a Raspberry Pi 4, that is going to fit in my uh, MIDI controller case along along with a battery. So basically, these are the steps I took to get Sunvox running on the Raspberry Pi. Fairly straightforward, like you just basically needed to compile the Dart code. So I should have said for those who aren't familiar with Dart, Dart has an option to compile to native binary. So it's not like, say, JavaScript, where you have to have the JavaScript runtime engine interpret or just in time compiling the code when it runs. What you can do with Dart is you can actually compile a standalone executable. Standalone is in the only thing it links to is the C library. Everything else is bundled in that executable file. And you can output that on like uh, Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, and for me, Linux, and ARM Linux as well. So there's like uh, x86 and ARM support. So thankfully, I can do both. And actually, RISC-V support coming, which is what my kind of final target is, but more on that in a sec. So basically, I had a 
compiled XZ. Link, in my case, it actually does, like, at runtime, link to the Sunbox library, because I need that. So it's not completely standalone, but close enough. And then I just put it into um, etc.rc.local to start up on uh, boot. And essentially, there we go. I've got a standalone hardware device, if not in a commercially viable form factor. Um, like I said a moment ago, even though I'm using ARM, I think I need something lower powered. And the current crop of RISC-V boards are very immature and very new, but luckily are already supported by Dart. So I can run my Dart, compiled Dart code on them. And more importantly, they're, they're significantly lower powered than, say, the Raspberry Pi 4, but yet powerful enough that they can cope with running Sunvox. So essentially, I think I've got something that's going to be a viable proposition to put into a case. So maybe next year, I can come back and actually show you a fully built standalone device and not just my Jerry Rig prototype. So with that, hopefully I've got enough time for a very quick demo. Um, I'm just going to run, oops, oh, for goodness sakes. It, sorry. I was going to try and run a webcam, if I click on the right button. So here's the device running here. Now, unfortunately, my cable is a little bit, audio cable, I've just found out, is a little bit wonky. So we may not get sound. But basically, I just wanted to quickly show you where, the inter where, where I'm up to at the moment with the interface. So I have the beginnings of a display for the sequencer, for the steps. But it's very rudimentary. So I'm going to skip that right now because that's literally the work in progress at the moment. What I also have, though, is essentially a chromatic keyboard. I'm sorry, the, res the contrast isn't great, but hopefully if I, sh I think it's small enough room that I can hold up and show you. Like, essentially, the white keys, the blue keys are the black keys because black doesn't go so well with uh, <laughs> RGB LED. So this is hopefully something that looks like a piano keyboard or a chromatic keyboard for those who play or who know their scales. And oh, actually, while I'm doing it, I might as well show it like this as well. Uh, these colored keys here, um, you can see they're much more nicely colored than in the video feed, uh, represent the different instruments that are available in the Sunvox project file. So if I go back to uh, this view, th finally, there's also another view here where it shows all the modules, not just the instruments, but all the effects modules and everything. Um, I hopefully can make maybe move the camera a bit closer and show you on the LED. So that's the distortion module. There's a flanger, echo, guitar. Oh, no. The ca it, it should be playing back the audio. Unfortunately, I think I've wiggled the cable and it's not playing back at the moment. I'll see if I can wiggle it some more and get it to play back <laughs> shortly. But basically, that gives you a preview of the sound. And you can also see, like, oops, I will put this back here. Um, with the shift function, what I've also added is displaying which things are connected to what. So you can see these light up saying that they're connected, which is, oops, sorry, which is, for instance, here, uh, it's not very well focused, but it says reverb connected to the, reverb 2 connected to the compressor. So that's basically kind of like the, the modular part of Sunvox, where it lets you connect all these different modules that do sound or sound effects and interconnect them together. Uh, there's a niche within the niche again called Eurorack, which lets people create all these hardware modules and to connect them with wires. And essentially, this is the software version of that. Um, likewise, I do have playback, simple playback, like in terms of play, pause, and stop. So I'm just going to try and play it, and I'll wiggle the cable to see if I can get audio happening. But if not, I can um, direct you to a video demo I have on my uh, YouTube account with um, th this basically the same thing actually w w connected to a working audio cable. But oh, it's very dodged, so I might not be able to get it working. So I might just leave it there and see if I can get it working in case if there's any time for questions while I field questions and wiggle with it. So with that, thank you very much for your time.
sorry. Um, yeah, do we have questions for Maxim? Oh, stand so Oh, yeah. Oh, there's one. Okay, awesome. great. Thanks very much for that. Um, I guess my first sort of thought there is if you've got a MIDI cable or a USB cable pretending to be a MIDI cable between the computer and the, the keyboard, then do you need to have, like, you know, you don't at that point need to have the um, Raspberry Pi or whatever's doing your audio right next to the fireboard. So it could actually be separate, couldn't it? Yes. Yeah. So it's like there's no restriction to have them all together. They can be like separated by meters. Um, and in fact, like that's what a lot of actual musicians who actually perform in front of people uh, do is that they'll have a bank of MIDI controllers connected to, say, um, a laptop that's like off to the side or somewhere, or also done by DJs as well, who these days often have basically electronic control decks and they're con actually just tied via USB to like a Mac or something that's like kind of behind the scenes and they're just doing all their controls via um, the MIDI controllers. Even like, yeah, even DJ kind of scratching stuff and everything. That's all available as MIDI controllers these days. So, yeah, there's no reason why I have to be together. I only put them together because, like I said, I wanted like a standalone portable device, just like, I guess, the, um, the, the commercial manufacturers do. And so that was my original idea was to have something where I can get it all into this case, oops, all into this one case. Uh, it's not very thick, so, but it should fit like basically a single board. There's plenty of room inside. I've opened it up. Um, enough, enough anyway to fit in like a small uh, single board computer and a smallish like USB battery and just like a little bit of DIY USB wiring to hook them all together inside with a tiny uh, hub. Yes. Okay, we have another question here. I was just curious what the Risk Five board was that you had up earlier. It looked like a Cypede or Cypede. I'm yes. Never sure how to pronounce it. Oh, okay. Very, very sharp eyes. Yes, it was a Cypede Lychee um, RV or um, RV dock, which uses like the D1 or winner D1 Risk Five um, microcontroller. That's become actually. One thing I didn't mention was the fact that you can't actually get Raspberry Pis at the moment unless you pay scalper prices, as in more than rock ticket, uh, rock concert prices. Whereas the D, the Risk chips, amazingly, even though they're so new, are actually available in, at least in small quantity, like am hobbyist quantities. Whereas buying even one or two Raspberry Pis, I think I saw uh, two hundred twenty dollars Australian dollars for one on um, eBay a little while ago, whereas these things are, I think, 20 US dollars. So, like, they're actually available. So not only are they a good fit for my uh, use case in terms of um, hardware profile, but they're actually obtainable at the moment, unlike Raspberry Pis. A great session, Maxim. Yes. Thanks, for, and cool project. I'm just curious if you could comment, as I understand it, with the commercial offerings equivalent to this, a lot of what you get is all the different sample libraries and sounds. Could you comment a little on what's available Libre-wise, or the ability to import other sound libraries and sounds, perhaps, please? Yeah, there's a huge cottage industry in um, sample libraries. Uh, some are free, some are paid. There's a lot of, actually, YouTubers who kind of, like, try and make a name for themselves by releasing either free or, like, uh, very cheap li sample libraries, like, for a few dollars. So, um, yeah, I could... Uh, and of course, there's com complete sites like freesound, uh, I think, .org, freesoundarchive.org, where there's like literally millions of uh, sounds available or samples available under fairly liberal um, licenses. But actually, what I should say is that most of these uh, devices do not come with uh, sample libraries. A few do, like as kind of like the manufacturers will bundle stuff. But for the most part, it's left to the owner to buy sample packs themselves. And some people have like literally gigabytes of samples. Like they complain that their whatever device they get, oh, it's only got like, you know, um, X number of gig storage. I can't fit my whole sample library on. This one actually takes um, SD cards up to 32 gig. And I have seen um, people complaining that, oh, I think that's going to be a bit too limiting for me. And, and, <laughs> and so like, yeah, that, um, 
that that is actually was one of the things that surprised me is like I guess there's a bit of a I wouldn't say magpie approach, but uh, there's definitely people who have huge collections, and I have to admit that I have fallen prey to that. Like I already have probably a couple of gig of just yeah um, sample pack libraries that I've just spot along the way, and I've probably spent like either fifteen or twenty dollars all up, and just for the purchased ones, and the rest were free. So. Um, there's so much um, free or very cheap sample libraries out there that I think um, if you are into sample-based music, it's really, I guess, a golden age in terms of making music with samples. I have a question for you, Max. Oh, sure. I'm just wondering, um, because I too am not very good at music and primarily listen to it, how long did it take you to kind of start playing it as an instrument and so, and what was the process so I, I have to admit like I said at the start I am an engineer who got into this from a very minimal musical background so playing it musically I if I'm completely honest is probably a little bit of a stretch like um, so far the best things that I've done uh, if I'm honest are essentially like covers of pieces that I've seen other people mainly on YouTube create. So, um, like, I watched, like, there was a video similar to Bob's video. There's actually, like, uh, I should have mentioned, a whole community of people on YouTube who make videos and they have to be in a particular uh, format and style. Like, there's certain conventions, like, normally you have little trinkets that are on the table next to the device or there's specific lighting that's being applied. Um, so there's that whole like kind of um, sub-community of people out there making that music. And so what I've done as a starting point, as a complete musical noob, is to essentially do, I guess, what um, visual artists do in terms of starting out by often copying like great masters or uh, famous like paintings. I started out by essentially trying to do like covers of not not famous pop songs or anything, but just of pieces that other people have done on similar devices. Usually I tr I've tried to find a similar but not the same device, so then I'm not directly just copying. I'm kind of like trying to figure out what the what technique and what um, settings or like techniques they've used on their device and then try and do something similar on the device I'm using. So yeah, it's, it's in some ways, um, like I, I'd say it's, it's in some ways a very appealing approach for someone coming from an engineering software background versus a musical background. Like people who come from a m musical background and I've, who I've talked to about this sort of thing have often said, oh, that feels so mechanical. Or, like I did a talk um, at a Sydney meetup about a month back, uh, similar to this, and one guy in the, when it was like time for questions, there was one chap who was sitting in the audience who shouted out me, you've killed live music. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you were the death of proper live pub bands. And I went, well... Possibly, but um, I think live pub bands are still quite alive and kicking. But I can see from a, mu uh, tra a more traditional musician's point of view how like this looks like a much more mechanical or um, less artistic approach. But honestly, when I've watched um, people on YouTube who are much better than I am do it, like there's so much like musical theory involved, which I haven't even touched on. Like I literally bought musical theory for dummies to try and learn what things like chords and scales were because that's how little I knew when I started. Um, how much musical theory is involved in what they do and then also a lot of the manual dexterity. Like um, I'll try and post maybe like after on um, my Twitter and uh, Mastodon just uh, some links to people's performances just to show like just kind of at the professional level how like involved it is and so really like I don't think the criticism that it's not uh, an as valid a type of music as more traditional or classical music genres are is valid so yeah hopefully that answers your question like my skills are very much um, early stage so that's why I did not play any of the th compositions I've done so far. Well, thank you so much, Max, and I think we can all join in in a round of applause for Max. Thank you very much.